Um, hello, everybody, and um, I think this is quite exciting for me as well. Um, never done this before. Um, and uh, if you uh, change to the next slides, we can we can start. Um, I would like to talk about. Uh, actually, it's quite a large topic: uh, the role of the Antarct of Antarctica in global tectonics. And uh, and I would like to take you on a tour through quite a variety of different aspects. And uh, if you look through my um, outline, um, we'll um, talk a little bit about uh, what uh, do we actually know about the Antarctic continents, uh, so the knowns and unknowns beneath ice. Uh, then we uh, take a step back and look where Antarctica place was uh, since Rodinia. Um, then uh, we take uh, take you on a tour actually around the Antarctica continental margins, um, and uh, and while we're doing this, we're breaking up Antarctica as part of uh, the Gondwana breakup. Um, then we have a look at the I think one of the most exciting uh, tectonic um, well tectonic features that uh, that we have in Antarctica, which is the West Antarctic Rift System, uh, and a couple of questions uh, when we address this. Uh, and um, I mean, coming from a polar research institute uh, that focuses uh, quite a bit on paleoclimate studies, I would like to go a little bit into the tectonic constraints on ice sheet dynamics and also the tectonic role Antarctica has played with regard to the Earth uh, climate system. And at the end, uh, a little bit of a summary, and then I'm looking forward to some questions. So next slide. Um, okay, let's um, let's remove um, the about three to four kilometer thick ice sheet um, of Antarctica, and um, and what you see um, uh, here is uh, actually the present day bedrock topography. Um, while it's a it's an image made uh, ready ten more than ten years ago, and there's an updated version in in the works in the moment, um, but still it's quite a, quite a decent overview of the different. Um, let's say, the different morphological units, uh, and that can tell us a little bit about uh, what lies underneath. Uh, obviously, as you probably all know, uh, the major division of Antarctica is east and west, separated uh, by the Transarctic, Transantarctic Mountains. And um, so for the first, the begin of the, the story, we, we will stay mostly in East Antarctica <clears throat> and move on to the next uh, slide, please. And uh, you see that uh, most of, well, what's called East Antarctic very often is called the East Antarctic Craton. Uh, it's basically an assemblage of more or less known, uh, it's probably less known, uh, individual cratonic units. Uh, for example, the Mawson Craton, the Maud Province, um, all stem from uh, the uh, uh, Archean and Proterozoic. Uh, and um, uh, only on a few spots, uh, actually, samples were, were taken and correlated uh, across to the uh, conjugate. Uh, uh, con uh, conjugate continents um, on the opposite side. <clears throat> uh, so, as I said, the, the Transantarctic Mountains, as part of the Ross origin, basically uh, separates East Antarc the East Antarctic Craton from uh, the Paleozoic and Mesozoic blocks, terrains, and belts, it's quite a mixture of them, uh, of West Antarctica. Um, as I said, the, the boundaries of all these craterons on the continent are not really well laid out, and as you can, I mean, probably get a have a good guess from 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 this very simple over, overview map alone. You can you probably figure that uh, some of most of the knowledge that that we have about uh, uh, the uh, Antarctic geology is from the very few outcrops, mostly close to the uh, to the coasts, and um, anything else um, that we know is basically derived from uh, mostly from airborne geophysics and a little bit uh, in the last years from seismology. Um, if, uh, um, if you move on to the next slide, um, you see actually an example of uh, what people have done just recently uh, by a major experiment um, around the Gamburtsev Mountains, which is uh, quite in the center of East Antarctica. And, um, and try to correlate 
these features observed from airborne geophysics, mostly airborne gravity, airborne magnetics, uh, but also seismics, uh, se seismology on 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 the, uh, ground stations, uh, long-term observ observations. Um, what people have come up with trying to to image a, a rift system, which is still highly debated through the East Antarctic continent. Uh, in fact, uh, it's supposed to continue along the Lambert Rift System and then all the way up to, to India, where it's, uh, it's probably continued along the Mahanadi Rift. Anyway, this is only a, a, a rough example of uh, sort of the, this, the status uh, of what we actually know uh, or what we think to know from a continent which has uh, the same size as Australia and, uh, and, uh, or Europe and uh, actually North America. Um, so it's relatively little, and um, so most uh, of what I'm going to talk about for the rest <coughs> uh, of this time is more about the, the continental margins and the breakup scenarios around Antarctica. So let's move back where the Antarctic uh, or East Antarctic continent actually uh, came from. So um, next slide. Um, this is an old presentation by the Plates Project at University of Texas in, in Austin, and uh, but still it's quite a quite a nice image uh, or a series of um, of plate uh, uh, reconstructions, um, mostly from paleomagnetics. Um, and as you as you all know, uh, there's a large uncertainty with uh, old paleomagnetic paleomagnetic reconstructions. Um, as only the paleo latitudes are relatively well uh, constrained, but the, but the longitudes not at all. And uh, so um, I'm not going to go through all these uh, slides here, but I just want to point out, uh, so if you look at East Antarctica, already in back in Rodinia time, um, it formed a part of Rodinia together with India and Australia. And move on to the next one. Um, so we move on one more time. Um, so by the time, a couple hundred million years later, so that's 430, uh, it was apparently on the southern, uh, already on the su southern hemisphere. By that, Africa connected, uh, uh, connected up to East Antarctica. <clears throat> and uh, the next one. Um, so that basically by around, let's say, 500, uh, 400, uh, the overall Gondwana continent actually was assembled. Um, the next one. <clears throat> so, um, lots of the, the Antarctic crate, East Antarctic cratons actually have quite, quite a long history with the neighboring continents, uh, India and Australia and part of it, uh, Africa. And, um, I would like to, to pay your, or that you pay your attention to the left uh, hand, uh, map. Um, it's actually by a study already a couple of years ago, but, but it actually demonstrates, um, the correlation that people have made, mostly petrologists and geochemists have made uh, across uh, um, the, um, the continental margins of all the conjugate uh, con continents. And, um, and it's uh, sort of striking um, that in uh, many places there where you had um, um, orogenic belts already in the Proterozoic, in the Mesozoic, and the Paleozoic. And many of these places actually, uh, the continents, uh, or Gond Gondwana broke, broke away again. Not always, as you see between Australia and, uh, and East Antarctica, at least what, of what we know. But in many parts, parts between India and uh, Antarctica, and especially Africa, um, and Antarctica, where we have the East African origin, or it's also called the Mozambique suture. Um, that's where uh, the Gondwana breakup um, about uh, 250 million years later occurred again. Um, <clears throat> on the right hand side, what you see there is basically uh, the imaged uh, boundaries uh, of that uh, between, actually, boundaries between, uh, boundary between East and West Gondwana along this major uh, Mozambique suture and or East African origin. Um, okay, the next one, um, the next slide. <clears throat> um, this is actually the last one that I show you with uh, all these uh, um, uh, old um, Gondwana assembly, but this, this is a particular good one because it 
it shows actually what happened uh, on the other side of East Antarctica where continents were not attached. In fact, for quite a long time, the East Antarctic um, margin towards um, just, well, towards basically towards, or east of, of Australia and, uh, and then Africa, basically the, the, what, what we have today, the Pacific margin, uh, that remained for an incredible large amount of time a basically a collisional, a subductional, uh, orogenic margin. Um, and um, basically a good part of, of eastern Australia, basically east of the so-called Tasman line, everything uh, that we know of West Antarctica, and a good part of the southern part of South Africa, which is the Cape Fold Belt, and then the entire Indian uh, belt uh, was probably assembled um, uh, from different varieties of terrains and, uh, and blocks that uh, accreted over this long, long history of, uh, Pacif of this Pacific or Proto-Pacific or Iapetus margin. Okay, now, uh, next one. <clears throat> um, I would like to now go on a tour around the Antarctica Antarctica, Antarctic continental margins, and uh, what you see actually here is the database uh, of what the data, basically the seismic database that we know that we use to um, take a look to analyze uh, uh, the, the structure and the nature uh, of the the passive margins around Antarctica. The yellow lines basically only um, they only mark the boundaries uh, towards the conjugate continents, so South America, Africa, India, Australia, and, and Zealandia, basically New Zealand. Um, <clears throat> next one. Um, when we look at the, at the composition, the, the nature, uh, the structure of the Antarctic continental margin, uh, it appears that, well, obviously, most of it, it's, it's entirely passive. Um, but it's only highly, also highly stretched, and I think what's what's also most stunning is that, uh, um, as opposed to other continent passive rifted margins, most of the Antarctic uh, divergent margins are entirely non-volcanic. Uh, only very few parts actually have uh, volcanic, um, uh, well, major parts of volcanic intrusions, um, seaward dipping reflectors, underplating. Uh, but that's relatively restricted to areas up in the uh, Weddell Sea, Eastern Weddell Sea area, and parts of Wilkes Land. <clears throat> and as least as most of what we know from seismic data analysis, that most of these margins are actually uh, non-volcanic, but uh, but highly stretched, uh, extended up to in parts up to 100 or even 300 kilometers beyond the shelf break. Um, okay. Um, Next one, um, okay, one more, one more Gondwana picture here. Uh, so what we do, we're going to walk around um, clockwise um, from uh, at breakup uh, between Antarctica, Africa, Af yeah, Antarctica, India, uh, Antarctica, Australia, and uh, uh, then uh, New Zealand. Okay, let's. Uh, you're going to see this this map actually appearing um, on on a couple of of the upcoming slides on a, as a it's like an like an inset map, so you know where we are when we uh, go on this uh, breakup tour. <clears throat> uh, next one. So we we'll, so we'll start um, with uh, the breakup uh, Antarctica, Africa, South America. Um, it was the oldest uh, breakup of, of Gondwana at that time. Um, and uh, I would like to show you actually some of the data that uh, has been, that have been used to constrain this breakup. Uh, so, so, so the map is, is obviously a satellite gravity um, uh, image and what you see in, uh, encircled uh, in, uh, actually in red, reddish uh, red boxes. Uh, down at the Lazarov Sea and the Risa Larsen Sea, and then on the opposite side at the Mozambique Basin, uh, east of uh, south, southern Africa. Um, that's where relatively good quality 
uh, magnetic spreading anomaly data were collected uh, in the last uh, 15 years. And um, so we we'll have a look at the Risa Larsen, uh, the Lazarev uh, Sea area down at the, the bottom of the map. And um, I'll show an image uh, of the magnetic data of that uh, box. So next uh, slide, please. Um, so take a look at this. Um, it's actually an airborne uh, magnetic survey that a couple of colleagues of mine collected uh, <coughs> uh, some years ago and, um, and compiled this into a grid. Um, and seafloor um, um, spreading anomalies um, um, so are sometimes difficult to interpret uh, if um, the magnetic line spacing is actually too coarse or if there's too many fracture zones in between. But this is probably an example, uh, one of the rare examples close to the Antarctic margin where, uh, at least for the Eastern Weddell Sea, the interpretation of the spreading anomaly can be done relatively simple. While um, obviously you see this uh, white, this uh, from the C34 to the M0, this white zone of, uh, of the Cretaceous quiet zone, um, and then spreading anomalies uh, seems to seem to appear from M0 to M17. That's the interpretation that M17 at that part of the margin is the oldest uh, crust of the Eastern Weddell Sea. Now let's uh, move on to the next uh, slide. Um, so we move a bit further east. Um, so the map on the right hand shows you the box of data from the Risa Larsen Sea. Uh, and the corresponding image of the magnetic spreading um, data is to the left. Uh, and that's uh, also, there was actually a, heli uh, a helicopter survey um, by uh, collected opportunistically along a ship cruise. Uh, uh, so the helicopter flew out while the, the ship was moving southward. And so with this technique, we um, uh, very often collect uh, um, uh, multi-track uh, magnetic data parallel to a ship track, and that allows you uh, quite uh, quite a good density and correlation of uh, magnetic spreading anomalies. So here it appears that uh, um, the interpretation is such that um, spreading anomalies from M0 to M24 can be identified. Um, M24, that's 153 million years, and, uh, and it's it seems that this is the oldest oceanic crust of any parts of the uh, of the Antarctic margins. So the very first breakup actually occurred, um, the Gondwana breakup occurred right at this location. So next um, slide. <clears throat> so um, when we, I'm going to show you a couple of figures on this uh, uh, on this rotation. Um, on the plate rotation between the, the actually the three plate system, Africa, South America, and East Antarctica. Uh, it's, it's actually more plates involved, but uh, to keep this relatively simple, uh, this is a, just a three plate uh, uh, rotation. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, we're going back at 167 million years. A lot of uh, continental stretching extension actually occurs between Africa and East Antarctica, not much is happening between Africa and South America. Uh, so next one. Um, so 147, we said that uh, at 153, the first oceanic crust uh, evolved in the Risa Larsen Sea, so on the, on the top right of the map. That's an area where quite a, at that time actually quite, quite some oceanic crust has evolved in a spreading direction um, the flow, flow line pretty much following the north-south uh, uh, strike. Um, while on the, in the Weddell Sea, um, the, the first uh, ocean crust was just initialized uh, at about that time. Uh, next one. <clears throat> so um, in the, Weddell, the Weddell Sea spreading continued on, uh, but it's quite oblique towards uh, the, the spreading direction of the Risa Larsen Sea. Basically, its, uh, its direction is, uh, is uh, different by, by about 90 degrees. Um, and so these different spreading directions actually are accompanied, accompanied by extension between South America and Africa. So you see the errors there at the Falkland Plateau. 
Uh, so uh, basically, Africa then, uh, South America then uh, moves away uh, and causes the crust to stretch between South America and Africa. So next one. Uh, so spreading is uh, fully going on in the Weddell Sea, in the Rizalasen Sea, but and also in the the southern the, the southernmost uh, Atlantic. Um, yeah. So um, now let's move on to the next slide, and uh, uh, we move over to the next conjugate. Uh, uh, plate pair, which is uh, in the India East Antarctic uh, plate separation, um, and uh, the map on the left hand side gives you an idea of what the database actually is to constrain this breakup. Um, this is actually done by by Carmen Geiner, um, came from from the University of Sydney group, um, and she um, and a couple of other people compiled. A huge uh, shipborne magnetic data set um, that have actually many nations uh, <laughs> acquired over probably 20, 30 years uh, in this area. Um, so they produced this grid of magnetic anomalies <clears throat> and, uh, and then tried to identify spreading anomalies in, in this grid. Um, so, um, what uh, this sector between the, the so-called Gunnerus Ridge on the left uh, and Bruce Rice on the right-hand side, that's pretty much the entire sector into which India fit at full, recon at full uh, reconstruction. Um, in between, you've got the Kerguelen Plateau, but that's something that developed uh, after, probably after the breakup. So, um, um, let's have... Uh, Let's have a look at some, some of the data, uh, so the next slide. Um, so what, uh, what they've done, they select, I mean, what you see on the left-hand side is just a selection of a couple of uh, magnetic tracks um, going running uh, south-north. Um, and um, what's indicated in this red box, that's actually a track following the red line that you see on the right, on the right side. Um, crossing the so-called um, uh, MCA, which is the Mac Robertson Coast Anomaly. It's a major uh, magnetic anomaly that follows a good part of the, the coast of Enderby land. <clears throat> um, and um, so what, what Carmen Geiner and, and, and uh, her group identified is uh, the oldest uh, anomaly is M9, um, the, the, young, the young end of, of, uh, of M9. Uh, so that's 100, around 130 million years, and that seems to be the oldest, uh, yeah, the oldest spreading anomaly. Uh, so the crust, uh, the breakup, must have occurred just before this, the, the 430 million years, according to this interpretation. Um, but you also see from the from the map on the right hand side that, uh, especially in the western part. Um, the identification of spreading anomalies is not that. Um, yeah, well, to a level where you, which you really w wish you would like to have. Um, and uh, there's probably several reasons for it. Um, one reason could be that lots of fracture zones disturb um, uh, a clear, correlatable uh, magnetic signal. Um, lots of sediments are deposited which uh, mask uh, spreading anomalies. And, uh, and also, it's also possible that. Uh, yeah, uh, that spreading on anomalies simply are not uh, simply not not that strong to be observed. So next one. Um, so what, uh, what what they also use to to constrain um, the, the breakup uh, story is uh, um, they, they looked at seismic data, multi-channel seismic data that were collected uh, quite uh, quite intensively along this margin, um, and some of uh, and actually some of the lines are really striking images of the basement structure. So um, this is actually the same, this, this seismic line that you see here follows the same red line that you saw on the map. So it's actually uh, the same location. And uh, so uh, ex there where we've got the magnetic MCA, uh, the McRobertson Coast Anomaly, which is a quite striking one, um, that's also the same location where 
uh, the basement structure uh, completely changed from a uh, block, block folding environment towards the, the continental shelf to a more unfolded and relatively smooth top of basement. So the character changes here. And, um, and together with, uh, there's also gravity modeling what they've done, but together with the magnetic um, uh, anomalies uh, and the seismics, uh, the identification of the co continent ocean boundary can be relatively well established uh, for this area. Okay, next one. So, um, um, so it seems that the breakup model uh, for India from Antarctica um, can be well constrained uh, using this uh, magnetic um, um, information, uh, this magnetic database, and, and the seismics. Um, however, um, as I mentioned before, that to the um, western part, the western side of, of, of this uh, um, uh, area, um, uh, the magnetic identification or spreading anomaly identification was not so clear. And just a couple of years ago, um, um, York, Wilfried Jokert and, and, and his, uh, his people actually went out and did a very detailed airborne uh, survey uh, with a fixed wing plane actually from the Japanese station, Sh uh, Shoba station. And uh, they tried to image uh, spreading anomalies in this area east of the Gunawas Ridge. So by, right, right there where uh, Sri, Sri, Sri Lanka and, and the southern part of India were attached uh, to Antarctica. And they, even though the data, the line spacing is dense, they couldn't see anything. There's no spreading anomalies. So in their interpretation is um, the interpretation is such that this area is actually part of the the white zone, the white Cretaceous normal supercron between 118 and 90 million years. So, in in, in that means that this the breakup between India and, and Antarctica, at least in this part, actually is much much younger, not as old as uh, uh, predicted by the work by by Gaina at all. So there's uh, some uh, dispute about this, and, uh, and I think, uh, um, yes, uh, uh, I think we will see how where the story will go. Uh, so next one, let's move on. Um, so on the right-hand side, you see an overview where we are. So we are just uh, uh, looking at the conjugate uh, pair Australia East Antarctica, basically uh, following the pretty much the Wilkes Land. Wilkes Land margin of uh, uh, of Antarctica, East Antarctica. Um, here, um, some of the, actually the, one of the newest work uh, by Joanne Whitaker from the Sydney Group um, actually did a uh, the newest reconstruction breakup reconstruction of this area, and uh, I'll just briefly summarize um, and uh, that uh, the breakup occurred, early, must, must have occurred earlier than 83 million years because the cron or the spreading anomalies at, at isochron uh, 34 can be relatively well imaged. <clears throat> uh, but the point of exact breakup, that's, that's a bit uh, unclear, but it's somewhere uh, between 83 and probably 87, 88 million years. Uh, and briefly after break, actually a couple of several million years after, uh, it's about 20 million years after the breakup, uh, spreading direction changed, uh, uh, or the pole, uh, rotation or pole rotation changed its, its location. Um, and uh, in fact, the most dramatic change in pole rotation occurred about 53 to 50 million years. But by then, um, at least uh, a good part of this Antarctic Australian uh, breakup margin has has been was already well established and. Uh, um, um, but what's uh, what's actually uh, still interesting at that time, what developed um, at that time, <clears throat> it's the connection between uh, Tasmania and the South Tasman Rise and uh, the eastern end of uh, with, uh, of Wilkes Land. So let's move to the next one. Um, a lot of that uh, work actually stem uh, on the breakup of this area stems from Steve Candy and John Stock, and uh, um, so uh, they uh, did a couple of uh, reconstructions uh, of this uh, three-plate um, situation between Zealandia, New Zealand, Australia, and East Antarctica, and it's a quite a compli complicated area. But uh, and we come back to uh, to the Rossi region um, in in a minute. 
But just have a look at the Tasmanian um, South, South Tasman rise um, uh, breakup from East Antarctica. It's actually a transform margin uh, that developed there um, uh, around um, uh, probably it probably started to develop around 70 or uh, between 70 and 80 million years. And so this image here at 61 at, at Kron 27, 61 million years showed uh, still a, uh, a close continent-to-continent -continent connection between Tasmania and the South Tasman Rise and East Antarctica. Um, so um, let, uh, let's move to the next slide. <clears throat> so by 33, actually by Kron uh, 13 old, um, that is uh, pretty much the moment where uh, South Tasman rise was subdued, stretched to an extent uh, that the breakup actually occurred somewhere along this uh, transform uh, margin system. Um, and we know from, and I come back to this also uh, when we talk about uh, Southern Ocean Gateways, um, but uh, so the moment uh, when breakup actually happened, it's very consistent with that what um, the uh, paleoceanography uh, people know from proxy analysis of uh, deep sea uh, drilling results. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so the first ocean crust, probably with with a, with in the deep water setting, probably developed at around uh, 34 million years. So next one. Uh, so by twin by by Kron eight uh, so twenty six point uh, five million years uh, the gateway was well established um, uh, but what happened what can, continued on was the story towards the uh, a breakup and actually a rift and opening story between East and West Antarctica towards the Ross Sea but we come to that um, uh, a little bit later okay so that's the breakup Australia East Antarctica now let's move to the New Zealand, um, Mary Birdland, or New Zealand West Antarctic breakup. Um, <clears throat> so, yep. So, um, um, what do you? <clears throat> okay, what on, on the top map you see basically all the main uh, the main players, the plate segments that played a role uh, in in this breakup, um, as we see uh, as we see the plate segments today. Uh, and in, a, in an inversion, um, Graham Eagles and, and people of our group actually, we, we did some, a uh, couple of years ago, some uh, quite a detailed reconstruction uh, between uh, Zealandia and, uh, and um, West Antarctica, uh, basically using the fracture zones as the main guide and then doing uh, um, similar to a, it's not a Hellinger inversion, but an inversion from somebody else, basically do a pole rotation um, uh, based on uh, fracture zone lin lineaments and uh, and the, and the best uh, best fit of conjugate uh, uh, margins. Okay, um, so let's zoom into uh, this. Um, so the next one. Okay, so it takes a little bit time to get used to this image. Um, so that's the situation at ninety million years. Uh, what you see in color uh, is the, the present-day gravity uh, signal, the uh, satellite gravity signal. Actually, for the Antarctic continent, it's not, not the gravity, it's basically the bad map um, image, uh, the one that I showed you right in the beginning. <clears throat> um, and what's in gray to the left, that's an area that was not modeled. And what's in gray to the right, where it says no gravity data because crust was subducted, uh, so it's crossed there, but obviously uh, there's no gravity data uh, available. So, uh, but anyway, uh, it uh, this this uh, basically it it's actually a real animation. But uh, but I'm only going to show you a few time slices out of out of this animation um, because there's some things that need to be explained in between. Uh, so what uh, what the situation. Uh, of the put of the uh, proto-Pacific margin along Gondwana was that it, as I said in the beginning, it was a long, enduring uh, story of continued subduction and collision, um, and um, it basically 
stopped for with respect to uh, west to, to Antarctica uh, at the time when the Higurangi Plateau, which is a large igneous province, uh, collided uh, with uh, the New Zealand uh, sub or microcontinent. So this collision of the Higurangi Plateau uh, with with the so-called Chatham Rise. Uh, which is part of uh, continental uh, New, Ze New Zealand, that happened uh, probably around 110, 110, uh, between 110 and 100 million years. Um, and uh, that caused the cessation of subduction. Uh, and it probably caused uh, the initial rift and uh, extension and then subsequent spreading between New Zealand and uh, Murray Birdland. Whether this also caused the West Antarctic rift, rift system, basically this a wide zone of extension all the way from New Zealand to the Transantarctic Mountains, that's not that's that's highly speculative, and uh, and uh, people are working on this, um, but uh, there's not enough constraints actually to 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 make it, to to prove this point. But um, <clears throat> anyway, so at 90 million years. Um, um, we have good evidence that spreading actually rifting and then while rifting basically the, the spreading from the Pacific or former Pacific Antarctic Ridge extended then into actually into uh, the New Zealand continent as rifting apart what we have today the Chatham Rise and the Campbell Plateau and creating the bounty, bounty uh, trough in between. This rifting actually was not was not a single um, well, single event. It probably was a distributed system within um, uh, the West, West well, the, 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 well, the <laughs> within the Amundsen Sea embayment, where we see actually off West Antarctica a lot of uh, rift structures uh, over quite a wide zone. So it actually probably was a distributed system. Uh, of multiple rift axes uh, until the final breakup actually occurred. So next one. Are you at 83? Yes. Okay. So you must be now at 83 million years. Um, yeah. And uh, so what? Uh, so that rifting actually rifting and spreading advanced. Uh, Campbell Plateau at 83 broke away. We know this quite well from spreading anomalies on either side between uh, Campbell Plateau and the Mary Birdland margin. Um, and uh, yeah, Bounty Trough had developed by then quite uh, uh, to a quite quite a, quite an extent. Next one. Okay, now by um, at around 79 million years. Um, the situation became a bit more complicated again uh, because we know from um, from uh, spreading anomalies, and actually we know from uh, yes, different set of spreading anomalies in the crust close to the present day Antarctic margin uh, that their their pole rotations was different uh, than the pole rotations uh, or pole rotation between the Pacific and the Arctic Ridge. So this. This part, which is now called Bellingshausen plate, um, must have been an independent uh, microplate uh, that acted totally independently of, of the, the plates around. It was not, and as you see, it was not active for too long, but it was active at some parts and played a role, uh, probably in the in the plate in, in the this, the history of plate reconstruction of, of or history of plate reorganizations of this part of the South Pacific. Okay, uh, so that Bellingshausen plate developed and it had on one side a compressional feature and the southern side we don't know exactly where, where the plate boundaries were, but there's some indications on using, I mean, from data on, on the uh, West Antarctic Amundsen Sea uh, embayment uh, side. Uh, so the next one. So we should be here now at seven, yes, look at an image at seven, or it's time slice at 70 million years. And uh, so Bellingshausen plate developed further on, uh, and um, yeah, um, there's not much more to say. So next one, 62, that's pretty much the last uh, bit of uh, uh, the evolution of this Bellingshausen plate. Um, 
And the next one, 61 million years, that's at uh, Cron 27. Uh, that's where major plate organization uh, occurred in the southern, southernmost Pacific uh, with a major change of, uh, uh, pole, of, of the rotation pole uh, between the Pacific and Arctic Ridge. And that was also the end of the Bellingshausen plate. Uh, so it fully integrated into the Antarctic plate and, um, yes, and uh, spreading uh, between New Zealand and West Antarctica continued. The story on the right-hand side, actually on the eastern, eastern side, is, is different uh, because uh, that's the only part along the old um, subduction margin, uh, the Pacific Antarct or the Pacific Gondwana subduction margin, that still continues on to being, being subducted, actually. Uh, the very last bit of current subdu subduction is the northernmost bit of the Antarctic Peninsula. I can't show this because I don't have an indicator, but if you look at the easternmost uh, tip of the Antarctic Peninsula to the very right, just opposite south, southern tip of South America, there is a, there's a, a last bit that is still being subducted. The rest of the subduction zone along the Antarctic Peninsula actually migrated eastward with a triple junction migrating eastward uh, from, uh, uh, actually from, yeah, from this, uh, this time slice 61, to, uh, to the present uh, uh, situation where the, the uh, triple jun junction is close to the checkered fracture zone. Okay, um, so that's, uh, that was the uh, next one. Next slide, please. Yep. So, um, so now the last bit of the Gondwana breakup is the uh, separation between Antarctica and South America. Um, and uh, what, uh, very briefly, um, because we go back to this when we talk about the gateways, um, this breakup actually is the last one um, between um, Antarctica and, and, uh, and, the, the, and one of the, the other Gondwana continents. Um, it happened uh, somewhere between 50 and 20 million years, uh, a study by, by Several people, especially here by, by Roy Livermore and Graham Eagles and, and some others, uh, try to do a more detailed reconstruction of this breakup. It's a very complicated region, and I'm not going to into, into detail with this. Uh, and it's still far from being solved uh, because of very little data that exists from this area. Um, but uh, uh, so it's a multiple microplate system with developing subduction. Uh, with a developing uh, ocean spreading system in the Scotia Sea um, and uh, several crustal blocks that uh, sort of float around the area and, uh, um, and the different uh, rotation poles. So, um, yeah, I think we, uh, now we uh, move on to uh, um, a different story and I hope you got some ideas of an overview on, on the breakup um, of uh, of Gondwana around Antarctica, but now let's uh, let's take a look. And I mentioned this before. Uh, let's take a look at the West Antarctic Rift System. Um, as I said in the beginning, this is I the, I think this is one of the most exciting uh, um, tectonic systems on on the continent. Um, we don't know whether it's still act active. Uh, there's no micro seismicity in the moment to uh, verify that, but it has been active for quite a long time and it has quite an effect of uh, what, uh, what, um, yes, what we, it has quite an effect, for example, on the ice sheet dynamics, it has quite an effect on what we try to predict uh, for climate research and, and ice sheet uh, dynamics in, in the future. So, uh, um, so that's actually really an area where tectonics meets climate and, uh, and glacial research. Um, so bounded by the Transantarctic Mountains um, um, towards the, its center, the West Antarctic Rift System stretches out across the entire Ross Sea uh, system. It's uh, apparently bound by the Mary Birdland, the MBL, the Mary Birdland uh, uplift region, um, and it continues uh, towards the the wall. Uh, towards the Antarctic Peninsula in a direction, and you see this by the question marks there, 
that is not entirely clear. There's a long debate of actually what this, uh, rest, where this is, uh, West Antarctic Rift System ends. And it must have ended somewhere because uh, at East and West Antarctic separation, um, uh, it was a definitely a plate boundary, and that uh, every plate boundary must, must, must find an, um, an end somewhere at another plate boundary. Uh, however, uh, it's not entirely clear where, what happened uh, uh, on, on its eastern side, which is to the uppermost left of your, of your map. Um, I'm not going to go into detail explaining all the details, uh, all the, uh, the symbols here. Uh, just note uh, the big black triangles. That's a, uh, um, an overview of, uh, of the uh, Cenozoic uh, volcanoes. Um, and a couple of uh, uh, yellow lines in the middle actually sh show some very deep rift basins um, in, uh, in the central part of the West Antarctic rift system. Okay, um, but let's move to the Rossi area. In that's actually where the timing of the rift actually was first established. Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you look at the the left pick, the left map, you probably remember um, the image I showed you by Steve Kenny from the reconstruction, the three plate. Antarctic, Australia, New Zealand plate reconstruction. Um, so that's uh, basically the area where after um, Tas Tasmanian and South Tasman rice split away, um, this area actually was still active for, for quite a while. And uh, some data, um, some geophysical data collected back in the late 90s <coughs> actually detected for the first time this uh, spreading regime in the so-called Ardao trough, which is this, this triangle that you see uh, on, on, on the map to the left and, and on the map to the right. And uh, it was actually Steve Kenny who, uh, and, and his, his group uh, who actually got, uh, um, got the magnetic spreading anomalies. Um, there is actually crons between 12, cron 12 and cron 18. So that uh, would lead to a uh, spreading history uh, in the age of uh, 33, uh, 43 to 26 million years uh, in the Adara Basin. Um, and uh, Fred Davy and, and, and some others tried to extend this Adara Basin spreading southward towards um, actually across the so-called Victoria Land Basin uh, in, the, in the western uh, Rossi uh, domain. And they, they can correlate this uh, with uh, extensional features known from geophysical data uh, in this basin and, and uh, constrain the pole of rotation for, uh, for, for the Adaro Basin. Okay, so it, it's a, um, so, so that's a clear indication of East-West Antarctic uh, uh, separation. Um, <clears throat> well, not separation, but, but extension. <clears throat> um, but it's only probably a, just a, a time slice or a time period. Uh, it, and uh, it's not clear wh whether the West Antarctic rift, rift system actually was, it probably was active much earlier than that, uh, known by some geological evidence on the uh, Mary Western Mary Birdland. Um, but uh, it's difficult to constrain this in terms of geophysical data, uh, what the activity was after, before and after uh, this uh, defined uh, Adara Basin uh, spreading. Okay, uh, next one. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Yeah. Um, so we tried uh, uh, to follow uh, the the rifting uh, from the Adara, uh, Adara Basin uh, and the Ross Sea into the continent, following basically a, a crustal thickness map and crustal extension, a stretching map um, with zones of, um, of of higher stretching. Um, assuming that these are areas where the main axis of the of the rift, rift system um, moved along, <clears throat> and using the the rotation poles um, uh, from Steve Kenny at the forty six or forty eight to twenty six million year motion, uh, and extending um, and using this pole rotation for the entire uh, for this entire plate boundary all the way to the Bellingshausen Sea. Uh, we come up with uh, quite a change in uh, in motion uh, from ex 
purely extensional uh, in the rusty area to uh, strike slip dextral motion uh, to the Bellingshausen Sea. And this change in, in motion direction or motion sense is probably a reason why um, in its eastern end the West Antarctic Rift System is so difficult to be identified because you don't, you don't really have major rift basins. It's a, it's a lot of uh, a transtensional, transpressional motion uh, but not uh, major basins of uh, ex extension. <clears throat> Okay, um, now let's move on to the next. Uh, I, I would like now to move, uh, change the topic slightly and just uh, move a, bit, a little bit into um, what we can use from the tectonics of Antarctica and the tectonic reconstruction of, of Antarctica for ice sheet dynamics and for uh, climate, paleoclimate research. So, um, uh, and what you see in, in this figure is uh, an example, it's a small example, but I think it's quite, um, well, if you look at the bathymetry data to the top left, it's actually quite interesting. Um, so we actually zoom into an area of, of West Antarctica, so it's the Amundsen Sea embayment, uh, actually the little overview map right on the top middle of, uh, of the screen that shows you, uh, the, shows the box where we are. Um, so this is the area where um, Chatham Rise and Campbell Plateau from New Zealand uh, broke away. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and as, as I said before, that a lot of the breakup structures, the rifting, the distributed rifting um, between New Zealand and West Antarctica uh, occurred over a white zone, uh, which is actually this uh, continental shelf of the so-called Amundsen Sea embayment. Um, so some years ago, we, we collected qu quite a um, big set of um, swath bathymetry, multi-beam bathymetry data. Uh, and uh, so when you look at these data and you, you see, okay, while well, ice streams actually follow uh, areas of uh, lowest resistance in the morphology, and uh, unless they form the morphology themselves, you see that uh, on the left-hand side, um, one of these ice streams actually uh, make, had, had, to, had to make quite a bend around the corner and uh, and a lot of uh, the direction of these former ice streams actually follow tectonic lineaments so we very I mean many uh, with, with quite a quite a bit of geophysical data we can identify tectonic lineaments that are associated with the breakup and now as a result um, uh, some of these linea lineaments um, form the basement in such a way uh, that in ice sheet dynamics, uh, uh, these obstacles actually play, a, play quite a role and divert uh, major ice streams. Okay, um, so let's move to the next one. Next slide. Yep. Um, okay, now, so now a story tectonics of Antarctica and the Earth climate system. And I'd like to talk briefly about, I have a few minutes, I guess, um, briefly about uh, the, um, uh, the role of uh, the Southern Ocean Gateways. Um, so, as you probably all know, that um, there is quite a debate on, um, on, the, on the reasons for the Eocene, Oligocene cooling and the Antarctic ice sheet growth. Um, whether it's really caused by the opening of the gate sets, the onset of the circ uh, Antarctic circ circumpolar current and the thermal isolation of Antarctica, or uh, is it a pure declining uh, CO2 uh, story that um, uh, De Conto and Pollard actually published some years ago. So, um, uh, so the, and, and I think one of the answers is that the reconstructions are in many ways not good enough to, to say what to what extent it was really deep water passage possible and uh, and when was it only shallow water but anyway this opening of both gateways actually the the, the most the most re the best models that we have for both gateways for deep water opening uh, say that it occurred at the eocene or the oligocene boundary where we have the major change in um, in oxygen, ox in isotope oxygen, or oxygen isotope record, and uh, and uh, with that uh, the temperature change. 
Okay, next one. <clears throat> so uh, for, with, with the example of the Tasmanian Gateway, um, um, so uh, ocean modelers actually, um, they, they, they think that before the breakup of the Tasmanian uh, Gateway, um, the, the small ocean basin between Australia and Antarctica but basically was a warm pool. Uh, same with warm water uh, that was diverted coming along the, east, uh, the Eastern Australian margin, basically diverting towards New Zealand and then moving up north again. So quite isolated pools until the opening happened and water, deep water passage was possible between the Indian Ocean uh, south of uh, Australia into the Pacific. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> um, so the same with the or similar story uh, with the opening of the of the Drake Passage and Scotia Sea Gateway, um, and um, as I said in the when I when we had a quick look at the Scotia Sea opening, uh, that is that is quite a quite a different story than Tasmanian Gateway because of the very complicated. A situation with um, differently rotating micro micro blocks and uh, small ocean basins developing uh, ocean spreading centers and subduction zones, uh, all in a relatively small location. <clears throat> um, but uh, the model that uh, that Roy Livermore and, and Graham Eagles actually developed, the tectonic model, has then been used uh, to reconstruct uh, the the flow of deep water. Um, across from the Pacific to the Atlantic, uh, from yes, from just about uh, 37 million years, and then after uh, the deep water break, uh, the, 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 after 34 million years, uh, basically from 30 to well, to the present, deep water passages uh, was possible in various um, uh, smaller gateways within uh, this rear arm. Okay, um, this is actually my second last one. Uh, next uh, slide. Um, that's, that should only base, well, this, this slide should only summarize basically uh, the, uh, the Southern Ocean uh, Current, Ocean Current System in relation to the breakup of, of the gateways. Um, basically, it's the same story. So, uh, Tasmanian Gateway and uh, Drake Passage and Scotia Sea Gateway pretty much open um, at uh, 33, 34 million years um, and uh, or 33, 32 million years and allowing a circumpolar current to develop. Um, okay, the next one. So it's um, a, a solution of, of, a, of a problem whether this gateway opening really played, played a major role uh, is basically paleobathymetry. Um, plate, recon plate kinematic reconstructions uh, are relatively well constrained with a few exceptions in the Scotia Sea maybe, um, but what is not really well constrained due to lack of data is actually how, how deep was the water passage. Uh, so uh, in simple by, simply by knowing the crustal age and, uh, and calculating the lithospheric subsidence or thermal subsidence alone would not uh, solve the problem because sediments are um, deposited and sediments are deposited at different sedimentation rates. In order to fully constrain this, uh, uh, we need to, one needs to, to, to get uh, actually to do a full uh, backstripping uh, uh, of, uh, of the deposited sediments together with lithospheric subsidence, together with plate kinematic reconstructions of these gateways in, in high detail. Um, so this uh, figure, what you see, is just a um, basically a, um, a summary of the paleobathymetric reconstruction uh, by the uh, University of Sydney group uh, some years ago. And uh, um, but but that doesn't include the sediments; it's only based on uh, basement depth. Okay, with this, actually, I would like to close. And if you move to the next uh, slide, this is um, a summary of uh, some of the, the points I went through during this presentation. So, um, yes, we've seen many cratonic segments of East Antarctica had already assembled before and within Rodinia supercontinent times. Antarctica remained a centerpiece of the Gondwana continent until its clockwise breakup from Africa, India, Australia, New Zealand, and South America from Jurassic to tertiary times. 
Most of Antarctic continental margins are of rifted uh, and non-volcanic type with relatively wide zone of stretched uh, continental crust. Um, the West Antarctic rift system developed as a consequence from rifting and breakup of New, of New Zealand after subduction ceased along its Proto-Pacific margin and as part of the relative motion between East and West Antarctica. And uh, the Southern Ocean gateways play an important role as detailed studies of the plate kinematics with paleobathymetric modeling enables global paleoclimate simulations. Thank you very much. <laughs>